Hello everyone. I had difficulty with the live stream today. It didn't go up to YouTube for some reason. So I'm going to attempt to go through what we discussed in class. And of course, if you have any questions, just please feel free to contact me. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> We're going to review static equilibrium. And many of these concepts should be familiar. But hopefully you'll gain a little bit of new insight in terms of how we can attempt to solve problems that range from axial loading to torsional loading to beams to trusses. Before we do that, though, we're going to review a little bit about what we discussed in our last class. So here's, here's our outline for today. Brief review from the last session, our first session, discuss Newton's law, the second law in particular, and its static form. <clears throat> then, as I mentioned, going into the axial loading, the torsional loading, beams, and, and trusses. We're really focusing, though, just on equilibrium. We'll talk a little bit about deformation, but really our emphasis is on equilibrium today. The primary structures we've been focusing on have been the bar, the shaft, and the beam, the transverse loading. And last time we discussed how the supportable loads that these structures might be able to withstand depends on their geometry. And we said for the bars that the amount of load that they'll be able to handle will depend on the cross-sectional area, <clears throat> not the length, not just a diameter, although it does depend on diameter, but it would be diameter squared if it's cylindrical. And then we also discussed how the loading, the torsional loading or the torque that we apply to a shaft will depend on diameter. And it depends on the third power of diameter. So if you increase the diameter by a factor of two, that's going to mean that you can probably handle maybe up to eight times as much of the load. And with transverse loading on beams, we discussed how it's not just one parameter that dictates how much load the beam will be able to withstand, but it's the thickness, it's the width, and also how long it is. And in this case, what we're assuming is that we have a point load at the end of the beam, and the beam itself is fixed or clamped to the wall. Now, even though we're just getting started in mechanics and materials and we haven't discussed the underlying physics and the derivations associated with these scaling laws, they are nonetheless useful and helpful in, I believe, how we're going to move forward. And it's important to note that the amount of load that a structure can take does not necessarily mean that the deflection that the structure will experience is going to scale with the same parameters. And that's one of the beautiful things about mechanics is that we have this opportunity to go between the loads, material properties, and the resulting strain and deformation to better understand these mechanical devices. Now, we live with Newton's second law primarily, but let's just review the three laws. First, a body remains at rest or in motion at a constant speed in a straight line unless acted upon by a force. We often say this is where momentum comes from. So we have P here is momentum, M is our mass, and V is the velocity. The second law often is stated as F equals MA, but can also be stated as force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. And yes, P dot is really uh, MA, and that's a typo there. There should be an M in front of the A, and it's the time-based derivative of momentum. So the third law states for um, two bodies exerting forces on each other, they're or these forces are going to have the same magnitude but opposite directions. So we can write that in terms of F12 if you want to say, okay, 
one is one mass, two is another mass, we could say that, okay, one acting on two is going to be equal to the opposite of two acting on one. And if we try to think about analogies to angular rotation or angular motion, we can think there's angular momentum, and that's going to be equal to some moment of inertia times angular velocity. This is what you see here. <clears throat> and then the second law is where we say, okay, summation of moments, summation of torques is going to be equal to some rate of change of this angular momentum. And we describe that usually as omega dot, and then, of course, i is multiplied against it. That's the moment of inertia again. Now, what's interesting is that the third law, while of course is applicable to linear motion, is a little bit more complicated when it comes to thinking about what happens <clears throat> with rotation. And it's not a great true analogy. Yes, if you have line of action between them and you can, you can get so kind of equal and opposite torques or equal and opposite moments. But by and large, when two objects are interacting with each other, <clears throat> they're interacting with each other through force. Even when we talk about gears, which you do in design mechanical components, we think about the torques on these gears, but we get down to the tooth level or the interactive level and say, hey, this force has to be in, um, opposed by a force from the other gear acting on it. So those interactions come down to, to force or action, reaction pairs, if you will, <clears throat> forces. Pardon my hoarseness. So for us in this class, static equilibrium, we're going to be focusing on the second law. And we're going to be using free body diagrams. We're going to be focusing on action, reaction pairs. And as you already know, we're going to be looking at summation of the forces being equal to zero and the summation of the moments equal to zero. <clears throat> and you can write that on a vector form if you want, and <clears> then <throat> break it down into scalars. So we're interested in some of the forces x direction equals zero, y, some of the forces in y direction equal to zero, some of the forces z direction equal to zero. And we're also interested in the sum of the moments <clears throat> in the x direction being equal to zero, etc. Now, in this class, we're primarily dealing with objects that are in a plane. There are some 3D systems that we'll look at, but we like to think of these as kind of two and a half D, right? We're going to be using forces in the X and the Y direction, and then we'll have moments coming out of the page or into the page, and those would be in the K direction. So that gives us kind of two and a half D. So, you know, often, sometimes though, you know, you will be looking at summation of forces in the z direction or in a third dimension, but not so much for this class. There are there are some cases. And likewise, we're primarily focused on just moments in, in the z direction. Now, let's go back to our three primary structures, and then we'll also hit trusses at the end. So here is external equilibrium on a bar. Very nice. The bar is rectangular-like, prismatic, if you will, and it has force on the bottom, force on the top, and <clears throat> we know that these are equal and opposite. If you look at this, say, yeah, we know this is an equilibrium, not moving, as long as there are no other forces that we haven't drawn here, and as long as force on the bottom and the force on the top are the same. So kind of maybe boring. But we're going to start from this boring level and expand. And I think you'll find some kind of interesting insights that you can keep in mind. <clears throat> we're also going to develop the framework, how we go about tackling this type of problem with some basic steps. So one of the first things you do when you get one of these systems, before you jump to looking at what's happening internally, we're going to look at the external equilibrium. Okay? What are the forces from the surrounding environment 
that are acting on the bar or the object. In this case, we have F and F. And then we will go ahead and define a coordinate system or, or set of axes. And it doesn't have to be complicated. But we go ahead and define it. And often it's simple enough to say, hey, this is one direction. Now, we said, hey, we just said we weren't going to do things in the Z direction. Well, we're still kind of working 2.5D. This is like a 1D problem <clears throat> in this case. <coughs> and whether I pick X or Y or Z, it's, it's not too important. But this is kind of a 1D, very basic case. And we're going to remember that this is a system where we want to think about external equilibrium. So, you know, think, okay, don't worry about anything in the inside right now. We're just going to think about what's going on with the environment acting on the object. <clears throat> and it's a statics problem, so this thing can't be accelerating. Right? So some of the forces in the z direction are equal to zero. Now, <clears throat> that's the first part. The second part is we look in the side. We say, okay, I'm going to take a slice, I'm going to take a section, and I'm going to draw out what I think the internal force should be. And you're going to typically want to define a coordinate system or axis there as well. Now, this coordinate axis does not need to be in the same direction as the global reference frame when you did the external reaction. And that's something that maybe we skip discussing a lot, but it's something we'll bring up here and it'll become a little more obvious in a second when we take another slice that they're just not in the same direction. So you can kind of do the external or you can you can perform equilibrium externally and then get down into the internal aspects of the structure. Here, we'll go ahead and apply the second law. <clears throat> and as you can see here, we have n1 minus f equals zero, then n1's got to be equal to f. Let's take another cut at this problem. <clears throat> here, we have a cut now where we've exposed the bottom. And we're going to put a force on the bottom. We're also going to define a local coordinate system. And <coughs> typically, what we want to do is define that coordinate system to be positive facing out from the surface that we've exposed. <clears throat> and we also typically want to go ahead and define a force that is also acting in that positive direction. So that's what you see here. So now we've got a system where we have our force internally, F2 here, and we have this force F1 internally here. And let's ask ourselves a question. Are these the same force? Okay. All right, we say that, okay, they're both equal to F, but are these two forces, this N2 and N1, are they the same? Are they equals? And we kind of have an inkling that sure, right? <clears throat> Our third law, you know, mentality is coming in that they're acting in opposite directions. Okay, that's that's fine. That doesn't mean they're not equivalent or equals, right? They are acting on different objects, okay, different surfaces. They could be at different heights. That's a, another subject of discussion that maybe we should discuss here, in that <clears throat> there's no other force or load or moment being applied in this system, you know, between here and here. So the behavior, the what what the material is experiencing in this region or in this region, it's it's all the same. Okay. And when we discuss stress, when we discuss strain in the future, that'll be something that we describe there as well. Okay, but they are acting opposite directions. They are equal in magnitude. And they do 
also essentially describe the same behavior. What does this mean? This means that that region or those regions are essentially the entire region between the top and the bottom is acting or is in tension, assuming that N1 or N2 or what if we call F1 or F2, <clears throat> as long as these are greater than zero. And that means that essentially it's acting or these this equilibrium, this pair of forces is acting to pull apart the material. Now, if N1 and N2 were the opposite, if they were less than zero, then the bar would be in compression and the top and bottom would essentially be wanting to get closer to each other, okay? Which allows us, or this conversation kind of allows us to think about conventions. And there are a number of them in mechanics. And some of them do not remain consistent across textbooks, across classes. So it's important to kind of agree on some of the conventions. This one, though, is, is pretty universal. That if the bar, or if you have these forces that are coming out and they're positive, then we're going to say that that these are leading to a system that's in tension. And that's what we're going to write right here. Okay, If F is greater than 0, then we have tension. If F is less than 0, it's going to be compression. Okay, And now if we look at these cuts over here that we had before just with the direction of the force is flipped if f is greater than zero we're going to have compression and if le if f is less than zero we're going to have tension it's important to agree on these conventions otherwise it's very difficult to communicate with with others and in our case, if we're building diagrams that describe forces or moments as a function of, <coughs> of length along an object, and we say one of us says is positive, so the other one says is negative, that will result in confusion. So please try to follow some of the conventions that we'll put forth here today. Now, let's do a slightly more complicated problem. We have multiple loads on an axial bar. We have an A, a B, a C, and a D. And then we have these forces acting at these locations. And, well, between the A and B, let's, let's change that. Let's just say between A and B, <clears throat> B and C, and C and D. Whoops, you can see the answers. It's okay. So we're going to do the same thing we did previously. We're going to apply external equilibrium and... When we do that, we're going to define our coordinate axis of interest. In this case, I'm going to say it's it's in this direction. Now, this one is kind of arbitrary, which one I pick, because it's the equilibrium for the external forces, for the whole structure. And we haven't broken things down. When we start slicing and dicing or making cuts, that's when it's important to have some of these conventions um, in place. So here we can apply Newton's second law. And if we do that, we get that minus FA, because that's in the negative direction, plus FB, plus FC, plus FD is going to be equal to zero. And the next step is to do method of sections, right? That's what we did when we just had a bar and force on top, force on bottom, we cut it in half. So we're going to take a slice and we're going to do exactly what we just did with the other system and draw out a portion. In this case, I've went ahead and I've drawn an internal force, FAB, and we have FA. We're going to define a coordinate system. Now, here is where I think it's worth to it's, it's, it's wise to kind of have some agreements. When you take that slice, go ahead and define the slice 
in that surface as having a positive direction coming out of it, as you see here with uh, what we've, we've, we've written. Then go about and apply <clears throat> Newton's second law. Here we have FAB minus FA is equal to zero, which results in the internal force just being equal to FA. And we know that when we're kind of near the edges on the extremes, often we can ignore everything else that's happening here, as long as these other forces are <clears throat> behaving in a way that we have collective equilibrium. The, the structure is not accelerating. So let's do another slice. Let's do another cut. Here, we're going to be looking at what is happening with FPC. We're going to go ahead and define this to be positive in this direction. And you notice this, 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 they're all the same, all the same direction right now. It doesn't have to be that way, but we're that's how we pick this one, right? If we had picked this one to be in the opposite direction, you'd still, I'd still suggest that if you're doing the cut and exposing to the right, exposing the right, then go ahead and define it this way. So FBC um, can be thought of as positive. FB can be thought of as positive. FA can be thought of as negative. And then we write out FBC is equal to FA minus FB. Let's do the next one. We're now going to look at FCD. We have FA, FB, FC. This is the positive direction. And we can write out the equilibrium here for FCB. And as you might guess, we don't have to keep slicing and exposing the right. We can slice and expose the left. So here is FD, right? Right, like here. And then we cut and we're trying to follow this convention where this is the, the plus X on that surface. And I'm going to write an FCD coming out. And Therefore, this is pretty straightforward. FCD is equal to FB. And notice, we have two expressions for FCD right here and here. But through this external equilibrium that we established, <clears throat> these are the same, right? FCD, or sorry, FD right here can be written as FA minus FB minus FC, right? That's what you have here, FA minus FB minus FC. So these are the same. Okay. And if you were interested in what's happening in the CD region, yes, if you've already established equilibrium on the whole thing, probably faster to cut and expose the left, like we did finally here. But you see, <clears throat> the local coordinate systems do not need to be the same as the global, nor do they need to be the same as each other for equilibrium to, for equilibrium to hold, for us to apply the second law. In the end, the algebra is going to work out. <clears throat> so now let's talk about torsional loading. In this case, we have our shaft. Again, first step, apply external equilibrium. We have an axis that we're going to define, and they we're going to say it's coming out of this phase. Pretty much you had two choices here. We have two choices. We could pick this side and have it being positive coming out here, we could pick that side and have it positive coming out there. <clears throat> Either one would be fine. This is a little bit easier to visualize given the perspective with which I drew this crude drawing. Now let's go ahead and apply Newton's second law. And to do that, we just write TA minus TB is equal to zero and TA is equal to TB. Now we'll take a slice. <clears throat> and expose a portion of the bar. So here, this is the TA, this is the side that we had here. Notice I haven't continued to write that Z is coming out here. I'm gonna say, <coughs> excuse me, that it's gonna be defined according to the surface that I've just cut. This is the surface and it's gonna be positive in that direction. And, <clears throat> Unlike what I did before, I kind of knew automatically, hey, there's a force coming out, so I'm just going to draw it coming out. I'm actually going to draw the coordinate system first, which is what we just did. And then after I know which direction is positive, then I'm going to define a torque, in this case TAB, that is positive according, according to the reference 
system that I've put in place. Okay, so this is plus C, so right hand roll, right, <clears throat> coming out. Now, let's apply Newton's second law, and it's a similar story to what we saw before. We have TAB, and we have TA. They're acting in equal and opposite ways, and so TAB is just going to be equal to TA. <clears throat> let's take a slice where we keep the back, this back portion right here, but we now expose a face facing us. Okay, again, pick your reference system to be positive, and then go ahead and put TAB to be positive in that direction. Notice TAB, TAB, fine, but they're actually in opposite directions, the way we've, we've drawn it. But they're in equal and opposite, they're acting on opposite faces as well. So if we do equilibrium again, what do we get? We get TAB in this case is equal to TB. That's fine. And we know that from the beginning, TA is equal to TB. Now, what about the behavior for this system? <clears throat> and what does it mean if, you know, TA is positive, TB is positive? Well, it, it means if TA is positive or greater than zero, then TB also has to be greater than zero. TAB will also be greater than zero. Okay, so it's like, well, that's that's pretty straightforward. Okay. What do you think deformation would look like? And this is maybe where things get a little bit tricky. Okay. You know, I have you know, maybe an object where I'm trying to twist, you know, here we go, right, we have some piece of paper, right? Uh, if I try to twist, you can kind of see what's happening with the, the sheets, right, as I twist right here. So, you know, in an undeformed state, let's just say this is kind of undeformed, okay, kind of. And if I drew um, a tube, or it's not a tube, right, I draw these lines on it, right, what do I expect? I I kind of have this nice grid. I pick a point, or not point, I pick a, an element, and I look down on this element, I'm looking down on it, and it's prismatic, it's rectangular, has 90 degree angle corners. Now, we apply a torque, okay? And this is weird, because this is not my right hand, this is my left hand. I'm gonna twist like that. Actually, maybe that, maybe it's like this, it depends on how you're looking at it, right? But you get the point, right? You see that this this line, I don't know if you can see, right? This line is now kind of twisted like that. So we can draw that as, as follows, okay? And I think it's, I get, I get confused about which direction a torque is acting in and how it's deforming the object. Okay. And so sometimes it's simpler to think about these lines and you realize if I pick an element here and then I, I'm looking down and I see kind of before the, the, they were like this. Now one of them is higher than the other, right? I'm going to say the one that's, this is the TA side and this is the TB side. Okay. And I've drawn, now we've drawn that there. And we can see that there's some deformation, okay? And this side, right, this is on the TA side, this is on the TB side, this has essentially been pushed up, this has been pushed back by this torsion. And that kind of is nice because it corresponds to what you see with these torques that are being applied to the shaft. So there are some arrows that you can put on it. These arrows don't have much significance yet because we haven't talked about shear stress or, or strain, but we have a little bit of perspective, okay? That TA, TB, they're causing it to, sh to shear this direction. And also that if I know this internal, internal shear, I'm sorry, um, torque, TAB, right? I can see that it's 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 causing 
in this case would be the right side to come back in this case is causing the left side to go forward and so the sign of tab has significance on the deformation and this is uh, a shear of these elements so let's let's look at doing a slightly more complicated problem all right <clears throat> we're going slowly through these problems to define the characteristics associated with keeping to some type of convention or some types of conventions and steps in the underlying deformation when we can. Okay, beams, we're going to kind of not talk too much about deformation now. It's a little more complicated, but we'll be able to look at some of the behavior as well in a second. But here's a system with three torques on it. T A, T B, T C, okay, acting at these different locations. And we're going to go ahead and define a coordinate system here. We're going to apply Newton's second law. We have T A minus T B minus T C is equal to zero. And then after doing that, we'll proceed to take a slice. So this slice is going to expose a region A B here. And with that slice, I'm going to see it. there's a face there. I'm going to find a coordinate system where something coming out of that is positive, out of that face. And we can then write out <clears throat> TAB. So we have TA, TAB. This is identical, essentially, to what we had last time. In fact, they use the same figure. And we'll apply Newton's second law, and we have the relationship between TAB and TA. Right, they're the same. Let's go one step further. Right, you see now the analogous or the analogy to what we did with <clears throat> normal forces on the bar. We have TA, TB, and this face again plus E. And also notice that this Z is not the same as the global reference frame that we used. <clears throat> After drawing it, I'm more comfortable. After, after drawing the direction on this face, I'm more comfortable than putting in a internal, an internal torque that you see here, TBC. And once again, we can apply the second law and come up with a relationship for TBC. <clears throat> it's just TA minus TB. And then we have the opportunity to cut and expose the left side. So this is the back TC right here. That's this TC. That's C. Now we're exposing something before we get to B. Okay. And again, pull out an arrow from the face plus Z, and then draw a torque corresponding, right? TBC. So this TBC, right, is in the opposite direction, but it's also an opposite face. <clears throat> TBC is equal to TC. And you say, okay, if I really wanted TBC, that might have been a faster way to do it, assuming I already knew TC. It's true. It's true. But right now we're trying to keep to some conventions, keep to some steps, and be able to explain our thought process and also the behavior, what's happening here. Notice, okay, this system, if TBC is positive, that's going to be doing the same thing, right? I mean, like I should say, yeah, if TBC is positive, TC is positive, right? That's going to be doing the same thing that we saw in the previous case. And here, um, if uh, we have to think about, um, it's, it's a little more complicated here, okay? Because here I have a TB and I have a TBC that's on, that are in the same direction. So in this case, I may be looking at a situation where one of them is greater than the other. Okay? It's not just about positive and negative. And if that's the case, right, the one that's more positive will be dictating that there's a shift on that face more so than the other, right, if we look at an element. So these tools are, are very powerful in terms of just getting an idea of what the behavior, how the material is reacting, even though we haven't introduced any type of relationship linking 
these loads to the deformation or the material properties. We've done torsion, we've done a bar. Now let's look at the beam, right? <clears throat> and as you know from statics, it's been a lot of time looking at beams. And here's a note that I put in during class today. That's why it's coming up a little bit early. There is a, There are some conventions that we're going to follow in Hibbler's book. We'll get into them in a second as, after we cut the beam. But this is a beam, cantilevered, point load on the end, has length L. We'll go ahead and begin to perform external equilibrium. And with that, we're going to define a coordinate system or, or a set of axes. And, you know, in torsion or the bar and, and the, the shaft, we were able to just kind of define one direction. We didn't think about three directions. We didn't think about X, Y, and Z. Just picked one. Once you start dealing with the beams, once we start dealing with the beams, it's probably wiser to think at least in, in two, like an X, a Y, and then, okay, yeah, we know that the moments are coming out of the page. So that's what we're going to do here. And define this coordinate system. This is for the external loads. <clears throat> and what's fun when you're doing the reactions for external equilibrium, here it's not so important. Okay, There are conventions when we do the slicing and dicing, as we were just discussed, having the positive direction coming out of the face that we expose. But here, take an educated guess. Okay, My educated guess is that there's going to be a reaction that's in the opposite direction of P. You don't have to put it in the opposite direction, but I like positive numbers when I'm dealing with these vectors. So that way. Um, this is going to be kind of curling it down, right? And I need something that's going to kind of be pushing it up. So MR like that is probably not a bad guess either. Now we'll apply Newton's second laws, Newton's second law, and not just with a force, not just with a torque, but with both forces and moments. And when we do that, we get that FR is equal to P. And if we do this with the moments, we got to select the location. We're going to select the left side here. Okay. I realized I was pointing at stuff, but you didn't see it. <laughs> um, it was on a different screen. Anyway, so here's the location where we're doing this moment at the left side. And we have our MR still counts there. FR we don't care about, but PL is the making a contribution, a negative moment. And that's what you see here. So we can write an expression where MR is equal to the PL. And remember, we had talked about scaling laws in our previous session, even though we haven't discuss their derivation, or the derivation of how much strength uh, an object might have. But look, if I tell you that the load that this structure can take, in other words, the load, how much P I can put on this, is dictated by moment, you see that if I increase the length, I'm increasing this moment. And it turns out this moment is proportional to, to a stress, okay? So if I make the, the, the beam longer, it's going to cause there to be a higher moment and a higher stress, and that's going to lead to us getting closer to a limit. So that's why it went with one over the length. Okay? As you increase the length, the amount of load that you're going to be able to take in, in the form of a, of a, a point load uh, with this P is going to be less. So let's now do our slicing and our dicing. Here we have our, our beam. We're going to have a defined direction. In this case, we'll say it's X. That's fine. It's coming out. Oh, um, I should maybe mention, yes, there are situations where you should keep track of the axial loads. Okay. I didn't do it here because they're zero. Okay. But that can also help like with the decision making here. <clears throat> okay, so that I have my X, you know, essentially again coming out of the face of the beam. 
So we do exposure. This is where the convention comes in. If I expose the right side, this is my slice, then I need the shear force, internal shear force, to be down in the moment this way. Now, that's how Hibbler does it. When I was an undergrad, we used a different book. We used CDL, uh, 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 Crandall Dahl Lardner, and they actually don't use the same convention. So when I started teaching here, I was like, this is odd. I don't remember it being this way. And it turns out the reason was is because I was using a different book and they defined the shear force the opposite direction. But they both agreed that smiliness is, is positivity, right? So this moment here that's being applied on, on this side is positive. It kind of leads to the beam smiling. Okay, so that's, that's an easy way to remember that one. But this one's the one that I always get confused with. Okay, again, we apply Newton's second law. And we have now a relationship for the shear force in terms of FR and P. So V is just equal to P. And if we look at the moment coming from the left side, we'll say that's equal to zero. So keep, this is our point of interest. MR is going to be coming out of the board, so that's positive. M, positivity, so it's coming out as well. Um, XV is maybe the harder one, but this one's negative. It's going to be applying a torque, and right, this is V of being applied at a distance X from this point, so minus XV. We're interested in M, so now we have an expression, because MR was defined way up here, the one that's far up, right, PL, and XV, right, V was figured out right here. So this is an expression for the moment, internal moment. So what about the behavior? Let's talk about the behavior. It's harder to describe deformation right now. Okay, There will be relationships later to describe the displacement, the vertical displacement of the beam as we go across it. It's curvature as well. But right now, let's just think about trying to keep track of the shear force and the bending moment. So when we do that, we often draw these diagrams, and you should be familiar with them from your time in statics, where we have shear force, bending moment, and we have some distance that we have there. So V is just equal to P. That's what you see here. So we draw it. And plotting something like this, I mean, yes, I can think, okay, Y equals MX plus B, but I don't usually do that here. I just say, okay, at X equals zero, what is this whole thing equal to? Well, it's equal to minus PL. And then at X equals L, what is it equal to? Well, it's equal to zero. So that's how I would draw it here. And these profiles of V and M are important, right? We don't know why exactly yet, because or we haven't done anything with them yet, but they are important. Take, take, or take everyone's word for it that we're going to be able to calculate stresses, strains, and deflections based off the profiles that we have. And if you like, you can use Colab, right? There's a, on, on the website, there's a, a Colab file and, you know, just kind of shows you for fun how to do some plotting. And again, you see the same profile that we just described, but I actually put in numbers. So this is L equals one meter per se, you know, and, uh, and P is equal to 100 newtons, right? And this is what you get. I'm going to gloss through this because we, I want to, I want to cover trusses, but take a look at the past information you've gathered about distributed loads on beams. Okay. And so I've put them here there, you know, you can download this. <clears throat> Honestly, these mathematical relationships are, are probably not this this slice or this page, this slide and the next slide have enough mathematical relationships probably to get you through. But please feel free to, to take a look in your statics book if you have Hibbler um, or if you have um, the mechanics and materials book, take a look. Uh, there's there's stuff in the first chapter on it. I, I think that um, Jeff Hansen does a nice job, too. 
talking about distributed loads using SAM centroids. And, and here are these other relationships, or you know, these are derived from essentially looking at the resultant force or the area under the curve for distributed load and the centroid, which is dictating the location of this resultant force. Okay, so I want to be operating two thirds over here, or that is if it's a triangular, okay, or a ramp, and it's going to be in the middle, right, if it's rectangular. So let's let's talk about trusses. This is our final topic for today, and if you want to read about this, because this should be review. You can go to Hibbler's book, Statics, or watch The Efficient Engineer, has, who has excellent videos, better than I can do, which is great. So we link to them about how you can go about analyzing trusses. Some really f fantastic imaging that, that that person has done there. So we know that trusses are, are present. They're great for supporting roofs structures, aerospace structures, and we think of the members in these cases as not being able to handle moments, okay? Is that 100% true all the time? Absolutely not, okay? And if you, you know, if you don't, if not perfectly pinned, right, then yeah, they can take some, some moments. But for the sake of our simple analyses, we're gonna say, you know, these, these members, they're going to be two force members. They're not going to be able to take any moments or transverse loads. And our methodology for handling these trusses is remarkably similar to what we were talking about. Define external equilibrium, apply Newton's second laws, or second law. Um, and then there, you know, you could apply method of sections, which is what we've been doing with the other structures. But trusses there's also something called method of joints which is useful so let's talk about method of joints and this is a little bit different than what we were doing but the first step is the same for both whether you use method of sections or method of joints same so here we have external equilibrium that we're going to attempt to satisfy with newton's second law we're going to look at these different reactions and in this case I have a really poorly drawn roller okay, just in the vertical direction and this is pinned they're both pinned but this cannot roll if this were to roll then the whole thing would just you know slide down the wall and over here we have a P that's that's hanging out here and maybe not the best naming convention but a B C one two three and we're gonna say that these have the same length one and two so that this is a one, one square root of two triangle, so that this is gonna have square root of two L, and that this angle is gonna be 45 degrees here and here. Go ahead and define a coordinate system or axes, and let's use Newton's second law. So we have the opportunity to say, what's the sum of the forces in the X direction? What's the sum of the forces in the Y direction? And also, what are the moments? And how, what are they doing? Um, so in this case, all right, we're going to, if we pick this point right here, we can say that, all right, I have AX acting some length L. I also have P acting some length L. And they're acting opposite. And so AX is equal to P. So this is really nice, really simple. And we've now defined all these reactions based on our satisfaction of external equilibrium. Our next step is to look at equilibrium at the joints. So let's go there. We have our three members, one, two, three, and we're gonna look at joint A, which would be this one, joint B, which would be this one, and joint C, which would be this one. And we're going to draw some arrows. Now, the arrows that we use for the reaction forces, we want to keep those directions. As you can see that AX, AY, those are there. But then we actually have some choices for 
remembers. If we draw them going away, all right, that means that those internal forces in those members are actually in tension. Okay, so there's like equal and opposite, right? This is acting this way, and that means that this joint is pulling that member. Okay, it's pulling it apart. And so got to be consistent. So if I do an F3 away from this node for this joint, I better do an F3 away from this joint as well. Okay, so that's that's important. I could have drawn, drawn it the other way. That's okay. <clears throat> but sometimes you want to take an educated guess. F3 is kind of an easy one to think about because it's like, oh, there's a force acting downward here. And this is a pin joint over here. Uh, maybe this is going to be in the being in tension. So I'm going to draw F3 that way. F1, a little bit less obvious. F2, again, maybe some type of educated guess that F2 is going to be in compression, okay, because this is kind of that force P, right? This thing's kind of swinging down, around, maybe compressing the second member. And joint C, right? I just got to make sure that I'm consistent. I said it. Member one, I was going to define to be in tension or kind of guess it's in tension, so I better do that. Member two, I was going to kind of guess that's in compression, so I better do that here. And CX is the same. So now let's apply Newton's second law. So this is exactly what we just had. These are the joints. This is just all rewritten. And now we write out some equations. This is in the y direction, okay? And then substituting P for AY, so that's what you get here. This is in the x direction. When you do these equilibriums, because these are two force members, there's no moment to balance. So this is, you get what you get. And that's what we got. Okay. Don't get upset. So joint B, same thing. <clears throat> in this case, P is in the vertical direction. So this is a Y equilibrium. And F2 and this component of F3 are in the X direction. Okay. I guess I should have mentioned, right, <clears throat> um, I should be careful about whether these are cosines or sines, right? Picking 45 degrees wasn't necessarily the best example in that case, but it makes things kind of simplistic. And then joint C, it's interesting, F1 is going to be equal to zero because there's no other force in that direction. So this becomes a zero force member, this one. And then this is in the X direction. These have to balance. <clears throat> now, zero force members are not unnecessary. Even though there's no force in them, they can still play an important role, either during assembly or just keeping the stability of the system, right? Making sure that this angle is more or less what it should be, okay? So that this can, can receive it in compression. And also, if the loads change for any reason, then maybe that member ends up bearing some of that load. So there are multiple reasons why, even though it's a zero force member, still an important member of the system. Do you expect that member to be the one to fail first? Probably not, because it's a zero force member. Now, um, this is just rewriting what we have here and then doing some of the algebra. So we can figure out, all right, AX we already knew was going to be P, that's over here. So we can now drop in F for F3. Um, these guys, they all combine to get F2 is equal to P. So we're, we're pretty much done, right? We have F1 is equal to zero, that's a zero force member. The F2 is equal to P and F3 is equal to square root of 2P. Now, if I guess, well, maybe I'll jump over here. This is the F, F1 is equal to zero, so this is a zero force member. Remember the direction that we defined F2, or not just F2, but the direction that we choose going into these, into or out of these nodes is important. And if we have a positive value, like F2, assuming P is positive, <clears throat> then F2 will be positive and it's going to be in compression, okay, because of the direction that it's acting on that member. So it's, um, we have the arrow going into the node, right, but then there's uh, going to be an arrow going into the member. Well, 
Number three, f3 is equal to square root of 2p. All right, so in that case, look, we drew it away from the nodes. So that means that that's going to be intention. Um, on, in Colab, I went ahead and solved this very kind of simple system of equations, right? And uh, this shows how you take these equations and rearrange them so that you can have kind of an A matrix. Um, whoops, <laughs> I didn't draw on the X. Shame, shame, shame. I need to do that, right? We got to solve for something here. So I'll just do it right now. If I can. Well, let me. Maybe it won't let me. I don't know. In fact, I really don't know because something just happened. Where my computer froze. Okay, gotta pause for a minute. Okay, we're back. I'm not quite sure what happened. It was so bad that PowerPoint gave me some interesting, you know, questionnaire thing that I didn't fill out. But anyway, I did go ahead and since, you know, I had a, a few seconds, I sloppily threw in F1, F2, F3 right here. And, and <clears throat> this is just showing how you could do this in IPython. And again, this script is available online. So that was method of joints. Now let's talk about method of sections. And this is our last topic. So for method of sections, First thing again is that we want to satisfy external equilibrium. And when we do that, we have the same thing that we had previously when we did the method of joints. <clears throat> now, then we do some slicing and dicing. What are we doing? We're trying to slice the truss in such a way that we expose members and we can then see into those members. We can do this cutting a maximum of three, because we have three equations for equilibrium, summation of forces x direction, summation of forces in y direction, and summation of moments about the z, <clears throat> at least for a planar system. So in this case, I can slice two here <coughs> as a starter. It means I'm not going to be able to figure out what's going on in member one unless I do another slice or shadowing. So here we have our exposed member, <clears throat> right like this, and our exposed member two, this is member three, member two, and we're gonna go ahead and write forces. Again, we can kind of guess this is gonna be in tension. I'm gonna guess this is gonna be in compression. Apply Newton's second law in the X, <clears throat> direction in the y direction and because there are only two members here <clears throat> we don't need to um, <coughs> apply um, equilibrium for the moments and with a, just a couple steps we got re relationships for f3 and p and relationships between f2 and P. This is compression. <clears throat> this is tension. So this is pretty fast. If I just needed to know the internal forces on those two members, I'd be done. And that's kind of the nice thing about method of sections. It gets you answers pretty quickly just where you slice. Method of joints kind of is like, hey, I'm going to solve the whole system. I'm going to determine internal forces in all the members. <clears throat> My method of sections is more of a pick and choose type technique. So let's choose another region to do a slice so that we can get member one. We already know it's a zero force member, right? But then it becomes obvious. Do this cut. Look, P and P, they balance out here. F1 has no one to play with. So it's just going to be zero. And that's the same result that we got previously. So here are some takeaways <clears throat> just for the method of sections and method of joints. 
they're both capable of revealing forces inside the members. So that's very nice. And as we mentioned previously, method of section or sections can be useful when we want values in a few members instead of solving for all the members, which is what you would do in method of joints. <clears throat> method of joints, right? You might plug things into a big matrix and a computer and let it solve. So here are the takeaways for today methodology or method our methodologies involve looking at external equilibrium first define a coordinate system or axis or axes apply newton's second law if it's a bar then you've only got forces to worry about <clears throat> if it's torsion a rod i mean a shaft or yeah broader shaft however you want to look at it then <clears throat> you only have torques to worry and if it's a beam, well, you better worry about moments and forces. Typically, we use method of sections, all right? And that's where we, again, define another coordinate system. We apply new and second laws. But if it's a truss, we could also use method of joints. And we have, then we apply new and second law. <clears throat> but in that case, there are only some, some mean forces because those are two force members and they can't handle moments. At any rate, this has been hopefully insightful in terms of how you can go about looking at equilibrium at the primary structures that we concern ourselves with in mechanics and materials and statics. I look forward to talking with you soon. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me and good luck. Let's have a good time with mechanics and materials. Thank you.